In this video in our Crash Course Trigonometry series, we're going to talk about fundamental identities, which are relationships between the six trigonometric functions that we talked about in the previous video. So here's a review of that video. So when we have a right triangle where we've got a 90 degree angle, our right angle there, with an other angle, an acute angle measuring theta, then we've got sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant, which are all ratios of the lengths of the three sides of this triangle. So the fundamental identities are all just going to be based on those definitions of those six functions. So one of the things we might notice is that there's a relationship between sine and cosecant, between secant and cosine, and between cotangent and tangent, which are all reciprocal relationships. And so we call these the reciprocal identities. To make these a little bit easier to understand, I've color coded these. So what we see is that since sine of theta is b over c, and cosecant of theta is c over b, those are just reciprocals of each other. So we write that by saying that cosecant of theta is equal to one over the sine of theta. Similarly, the cosine of theta is a over c, the secant of theta is c over a, and so those are reciprocals of each other. And then finally, tangent of theta is b over a, cotangent of theta is a over b, so those are reciprocals of each other as well. So we've got three reciprocal identities based on those relationships. Another relationship that we see here are quotient identities. So these are a little bit harder to tell, but again, I've color coded these for you. So what we see is that sine of theta is b over c. So when I say sine of theta divided by cosine of theta, that's b over c divided by a over c. And if I multiply top and bottom by c, the c's will divide out and I get b over a, which is the tangent of theta. Similarly, cosine of theta is a over c sine of theta is b over c. So again, if I multiply top and bottom by c, the c's will go away, and I end up with a over b, which again is cotangent of theta. One thing I want to note here is that when I write sine of theta divided by cosine of theta, we're not multiplying there, right? That doesn't mean sine times theta or cosine times theta. Sine and cosine are functions. So the way that we, we should really write this is sine of theta using function notation, cosine of theta using function notation. And when it would be potentially confusing, we will write it like that, but normally we write these trig functions without the parentheses. So you just have to get used to understanding that, for example, I can't quote unquote cancel out the thetas in that fraction because there is no multiplication happening there. So that's not sine times theta, that's sine of theta. It it's, might seem like a subtle difference, but it's very important for us to understand what we can do algebraically when we have expressions involving trig functions. The next set of identities are called Pythagorean identities because they come out of the Pythagorean theorem. Another note on notation here. So let's take a look at this expression right here. So it says sine squared of theta. And that might seem a little bit strange, again, especially since we said that sine of theta is really a function, so sine of theta. So how could I square just the sine part? That doesn't really make sense. It's not really the way that we normally write functions. And mostly for historical reasons, it's a little bit of an unfortunate notation. But when we say sine squared of theta, what we really mean is sine of theta, and then we square that. And then cosine squared here, again, means cosine of theta, and then we square that. So it is a little bit unfortunate that we put the square on the trig function, but it's a really common notation. It's something that you're gonna see a lot. So unfortunately, it's something we're gonna to have to get used to. Okay, so why do these identities work? Let's take a look at the first one there, which I've colored in blue here. So we've got sine of theta is b over c. So if I square sine of theta, that's b over c squared. And then cosine of theta squared, that's a over c squared. That's gonna be b squared over c squared plus a squared over c squared. Common denominator, that's gonna be b squared plus a squared. But my, my Pythagorean theorem says that a squared plus b squared does equal c squared, so that's just c squared over c squared, which works out to be one. So that's why the first identity works. And if you play around with the second and third identities, again, just plugging in the fractions uh, based on the definition of the trig functions, you'll see that those work out as well, and they all just follow from the Pythagorean theorem. So let's just look at an example here of how we can use these identities to help us figure out the six values of the trigonometric functions if we know one. So if I'm given you that cosine of theta is two thirds, what are the five remaining trigonometric functions?
Well, one of the easiest ones to figure out from knowing cosine is secant, because a reciprocal identity that we have says that secant theta is one over cosine theta. We know that cosine theta is two thirds, so secant theta is the reciprocal of two thirds, which would be three halves. So that's using our reciprocal identities. Uh, another way that we can get another trig function is using a Pythagorean identity. So we know that sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals one. We know that cosine of theta is two thirds, so the cosine of theta squared is two thirds squared. Two thirds squared is four ninths. Continue to solve here, we get sine squared of theta is five ninths. We subtract four ninths from both sides. One is nine ninths, so nine ninths minus four ninths is five ninths. And then we just take the square root of both sides. So the sine of theta is going to be the square root of five ninths. Now, normally when we take the square root of both sides of an equation, we have to worry about the possibility that our solution is negative. So in other words, we get a plus or minus when we take the square root of both sides. But we don't have to worry about that here because all of our trig functions of acute angles are all positive because they are ratios of lengths and the lengths are positive. So how could we simplify the square root of five ninths? We don't have to simplify. We could just leave it as the square root of five ninths, but we could make it look a little bit nicer by writing that as the square root of five divided by the square root of nine, the square root of five divided by three. So that's my secant theta and my sine of theta. In fact, let's make a little chart here so we can keep track of what we're doing. So what is the trig function? And then what's the value? So we know that this cosine of theta is two thirds. That's one they gave us. We figured out that the secant of theta is three halves, and we just figured out that the sine of theta is square root of five over three. And now again, we're just gonna keep using those identities to figure out what's missing. So the next one we could figure out might be tangent. So we know tangent of theta is sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. That's one of our quotient identities. Sine of theta we know is square root of five over three. Cosine of theta is two over three. Again, that's what they gave us. Multiply top and bottom by three there, and we end up with square root of five over two. And now we, what are we missing? So we're missing cosecant and we're missing cotangent. And again, we've got different ways of doing this, but all of the different identities that we could use should give us the same values. So for example, we know that cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. So that means that the cotangent of theta is one divided by the tangent of theta. So that's one divided by the square root of five over two. So that just flips that fraction over and we get two over the square root of five. Now, for me personally, when I teach this material, I don't insist that we rationalize denominators, but some teachers do. So if you do need to rationalize that denominator, we would just multiply top and bottom by the square root of five. And so that would give us two radical five on the top and five on the bottom. So both of those are the same expression. So I would be fine with a student leaving it as two over the square root of five. But if your teacher insists that you rationalize denominators, then we would write that as two radical five over five. Those are both the same number. And then finally, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So that's gonna be one over the sine of theta. Sine of theta earlier we figured out was square root of five over three, which is three over the square root of five. And again, rationalizing the denominator if necessary, that's three radical five over five. And so that's what we would stick in here for cosecant, three over the square root of five, or alternatively, three radical five over five. So that shows you how we can use the different identities and relationships that we've talked about to figure out the values of all six trig functions once we know one of the trig values. Another way that we can relate together the different trigonometric functions is by talking about complementary angles. So a quick note here, there's a very similar word in English called complementary with an I, and that's when you say something nice about somebody. So that's when you pay someone a compliment. That's uh, a different word. So complement means two things that fit together, right? So two things that go well together, you know, like peanut butter and chocolate are complementary. I don't know, maybe you don't like those things, but those are, those are common uh, things that taste good together. Anyway. Um, so when you have two angles that add up to 90 degrees uh, in mathematics, we call those angles complementary. And that's relevant for us because when we have a right triangle, 
we know that the three angles of a triangle add up to 180. When we already have one of the angles measuring 90 degrees, that means that the other two angles are going to be complementary. Those are going to have to add up to 90 to make the whole triangle add up to 180. And now, because of this, we know that the values of those trigonometric functions are going to be related. So let's take a look here. So we've got our angle labeled theta there in the lower left-hand corner of our triangle. And as we were just saying, that means the angle up here at the point A measures 90 minus theta. So what's the sine of 90 minus theta? Well, in a right triangle, the sine of an angle is opposite over hypotenuse. There's that Sokotoa again. But for the 90 minus theta angle, the opposite side is little a, and the hypotenuse is c. But that's the cosine of the angle theta, because for the theta angle, little a is the adjacent side. And so all we're doing is saying if you switch to the other acute angle in your right triangle, the functions switch. So the sine of 90 minus theta is the cosine of theta. And similarly, the cosine of 90 minus theta is the sine of theta. The tangent of 90 minus theta turns out to be the cotangent of theta, and so on. And so this is what the co in those functions stands for. The co stands for complementary. So cosine is the complementary of the sine. Cosecant is the complementary of the secant. So if you were wondering why we had sort of three different names and then co in front of each of the three other names, this is why. This is why we have that naming convention. Okay, so what did we talk about in this video? So we talked about how to compute the six trigonometric functions of acute angles. We had established those in the previous video, but we talked more about those properties. We've talked about fundamental identities. We talked about how to use those identities to compute all six functions of a given angle. And then we also talked about complementary angles. So next time we'll talk about how to actually compute the value of trigonometric functions for certain angles, both uh, analytically finding exact answers and also computationally using a calculator. And then after that, we'll talk about applications of trigonometric ideas.